and uh, we're in Romans chapter four this morning. Romans chapter number four. Romans chapter number four. Romans chapter number four. Praise the Lord for the book of Romans as Paul has just gone in detail trying to uh, reach his heart for the Jewish people and at the same time uh, the apostle to the Gentiles and and uh, trying to bring understanding uh, to their hearts and their minds knowing the terror of the Lord we persuade men and so he very meticulously is going through and uh, trying to express chapters one two and three all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, so trying to bring them to an understanding that uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is not a respecter of persons. Thou art inexcusable, O man. And as we uh, look at uh, here in, in uh, and so chapter three, he ends with being justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And and uh, as uh, he's uh, shared with them the way of salvation, uh, you come to uh, chapter four and uh, of course. Uh, here in, in chapter 4, you cannot add to what Christ has done. Uh, you cannot add to what Christ has done. And, and uh, Christ paid it all, amen? And uh, so as we look at, uh, at uh, this uh, Romans chapter number 4, and title the message, From Rags to Riches. Doesn't that sound good? From Rags to Riches. And, and uh, here in, in chapter uh, 1, 2, and 3, all are sinners. And, uh, and yet Paul goes on to share what we'd have. We, we, we teach the uh, discipleship lesson called the ABCs of Christian Growth. And, and uh, after somebody is saved, the very first lesson, called the preliminary lesson that you get, uh, but it just uh, goes through. And, of course, it's, it's uh, uh, what you were, what you did, uh, what you are, and what Christ did for you. And it's just giving an understanding. Now that you're saved, uh, to look back and see this is what actually took place uh, now it happened in an instant uh, the moment that you in your heart realized you were a sinner and Christ was a savior and you believed on him the Bible says that you were saved uh, and uh, and so it's exciting to be saved and, and this uh, lesson just go through and designed are to uh, to give you uh, you know an understanding of what just took place and then the second lesson uh, where do we go from here uh, it talks about things like reading the Bible, going to church, getting baptized, those first steps a baby Christian takes, and, and then the first uh, main lesson of the series, assurance of salvation. Uh, and uh, why it's too good to be true, isn't it? Uh, it's too good to be true. To, uh, and and uh, we're taught if it's too good to be true, then it's probably too good to be true. And, and so it's not true. But when it comes to salvation, uh, there is one thing you can say in life that is too good uh, to be true and yet it's true and that's uh, that uh, a lost sinner in a moment can become uh, a saved soul uh, on his way to heaven a saved servant uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and and to go from rags to riches and and so we find here in chapter number four and and verse one the Bible says here uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Verse 6. Even as David also described, describeth the blessedness of the man. Let's talk about the man who's gotten saved. The man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Father, as we uh, come to lift up your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, thank you for the salvation you've given us. Uh, Lord, to those that are not saved this morning, I, I pray that they'd have that salvation today. 
uh, Lord, that their hearts would just be awakened and and uh, Father, that uh, that uh, you would uh, just uh, save them and and uh, Lord, take them from uh, from uh, being in rags to riches. I pray, Father, that you would bless uh, the uh, message and and Father, as we come, it would be a time of rejoicing as a Christian as we give thanks uh, for all that you've done for us. A time just to be able to lift up and praise you and worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. From rags to riches. Uh, from where Christ, where we were, where Christ found us, to where we uh, are today. And, and uh, you know, in that, that, uh, that position happened. The Bible says we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And uh, we already uh, have a, a home in heaven. And, and uh, if, if you're saved today, we're not waiting for closing. It's already closed. It's already a done deal. It's a contract. It's, uh, you know, uh, God says the moment you trust Christ as your Savior, uh, you become a citizen of heaven, a child of God, adopted into his family, and, and you've just gone from rags to riches. Thinking of Memorial Day as we uh, just celebrate the great nation that God has given us, and and of course those who have given the price to pay uh, that we might have it, and and uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, gone to the website or not, but there's a website you can go to to see the national debt counter. If you've ever seen that, and uh, it'll fill up your whole screen. But uh, anyway, it's just a counter that's going. It shows you our national debt. It, it's amazing how big our national debt is. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, uh, there was a time that we thought millions was a lot. And then we got to billions being a lot. Now it's trillions. And, and uh, it's just kind of a, uh, you know, uh, t to see that counter. I, I watch that counter as it's going. And I don't spend a lot of time watching that counter. But I've just gone to the website to see the counter. And, and y you want to reach up and stop it. Uh, but there's no stopping it. Uh, and, uh, you know, just the interest alone is burying us. We can't even pay the interest as a nation that we owe on the debts, and yet we're still making more debts. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, there, there, there's no stopping it. And, and uh, you know, to be able to, uh, to uh, take and, and turn that, uh, you know, you, you just like to slow it down a little bit maybe. But, uh, I mean, it's just uh, talk about the, you know, $100 is nothing on that counter and thousands of dollars. And it takes a lot, though, to make a trillion before that trillion turns over. But, uh, but as you, uh, you look at that, uh, you know, counter just running, uh, it's 24 hours a day. Uh, it's seven days a week. Uh, every second that uh, counter is rolling and and we're accruing interest on our debts let alone the uh, the money we're still uh, borrowing to keep uh, running as a nation from other countries and other nations and and uh, you wonder you know you blow up that balloon how big it can get before it bursts and what's gonna uh, you know uh, take place when it does and and uh, and so as we we just look at uh, you know again that uh, that uh, that debt that uh, it, it's unstoppable that is taking place uh, as a nation we're bankrupt we just don't realize it we don't admit it yet but we're bankrupt uh, and uh, you know what the definition of bankrupt when you're bankrupt when your outgo exceeds your income uh, when your outgo exceeds your income you're 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 downhill and uh, it's just a matter of time that it's going to take place and and uh, but uh, you know it's just uh, just a head and a downhill uh, I don't know if anyone in here has ever claimed bankruptcy before, but uh, what a feeling it must be to be bankrupt. I've, I've, uh, you know, I, I, I thank the Lord. I've never been there. Uh, I, uh, uh, I uh, just uh, praise the Lord. The bills have come in. I've always had the money to pay them. Uh, and uh, I, uh, up to this point, haven't, you know, known what it's, it's like to, uh, to uh, uh, go a month and, and hope they don't come and take my car away. Uh, because I haven't made the next payment and and uh, you know, but you've probably been there uh, or uh, you know At least a majority of Americans have been there where uh, you know You're, you're saying uh, give me one more month and you're on the phone talking to them and and uh, don't shut my lights off Can I can I pay you a down payment until I can get it and and uh, you know, just what a uh, what a helpless uh, Thing it is to to be bankrupt uh, The bank is empty. It's upside down. You owe more than what you got and no hope of being able to pay it just trying to hold off the creditors long enough so that you can enjoy another day uh, if you're like that today I don't mean to stir up those things but uh, you know uh, many many Americans settle with that and, and uh, from rags to riches just looking up and I don't know if you've heard of him before or not but his name is Paul Potts anybody heard of Paul Potts before uh, he's a tenor, well-known tenor, especially in England. But 
Uh, anyway, uh, part of his, uh, his uh, uh, presentation is he often shares with them how he went from rags to riches. And he just shares, uh, you know, in, in his, uh, his, his testimony that, uh, you know, he was going along, things going pretty good, and, and uh, he, he came to a month where uh, he had a few days to payday and no money. And so what did he do? He got a credit card. And, uh, you know, it's all go ahead and, and buy some groceries on it. And in a few days when I get paid, I'll pay it off. Well, the next month, now he's 10 days from payday. Well, I'll just go ahead and charge my expenses for 10 days, and I'll pay it off when I get paid on payday. Pretty soon, he said it was two weeks to go till payday. Well, I made it halfway through the month. And then he realized, i got to charge it, but I'll pay it off when payday comes. Before long, it was a month. His paycheck was just paying his credit card bill so that he could live. And then next month, everything was on the credit card. Uh, after a while, that credit card, uh, his paycheck would not pay the credit card bill. Now he's got a little bit of a balance on that credit card bill uh, at the end of the month. So his paycheck is not even paying his credit card bill. Pretty soon the balance on that credit card is growing. And he's not even able to get come close to paying it. After a while that credit card got maxed out. So before he knew it, he was two months behind on his mortgage payment. And, uh, and to the point of just uh, uh, discouragement, wondering, when's the bank going to send me that letter uh, that they're taking back my house? But he found an opportunity to get to sing in a contest. And uh, at that contest, he sang and he won. Big sum of money. Uh, he won in that, that contest. All of a sudden, he's able to pay off all of his bills. Uh, well, people heard his tenor voice and calls started coming in. People started asking for him to come and sing for them and paying him huge sums of money. And uh, overnight, he went from being uh, bankrupt to all of a sudden having multi-million, being a multi-millionaire, uh, just in a short period of time. Uh, and uh, but uh, you know that that feeling of of of, of being at the rag stage, of being a broke and and uh, you know and, and bankrupt and and uh, having a nothing and no hope of anything coming in, uh, and then to go to the point of now. Uh, being a multi-millionaire. Uh, that's why a lot of people play the lottery, by the way. Uh, it's not the way to do it, but that's why a lot of people do. And uh, uh, it's almost impossible odds, uh, impossible odds for you to win it, but uh, you, you just go further in debt. There's people that go in debt playing that lottery, hoping that it's going to buy them out of debt. Uh, that's where gambling addictions come from. Uh, people go to hope to, to, to win at first. It's just, you know, some extra change and, you know, you, uh, it's fun and whatever. And, and, uh, pretty soon your, your extra change becomes a little bit more extra change. And then pretty, before you know it, uh, you're, uh, uh, you don't have enough to pay the bills. So now you're going to, to hopefully win a little bit more and Hey, I can't pay my mortgage payment anyway. I only got half of it. So I might as well throw half of it on the table. And there's a hope that I, uh, you know, might be able to pay it, but, uh, but I know that they're not going to accept half of it. And, and so uh, half's not enough, and so I might as well, uh, you know, just to go for broke, and, and uh, before you know it, bankrupt. Every one of us are born morally bankrupt. Some people don't know it yet. Uh, we start out sinners. Uh, we start out behind. And uh, as we go through life, that debt just grows. Uh, I mean, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, man's religion, man's hope is, is that our good works will outcome our overcome our bad works. Maybe if I do more good things than I did bad things, God will let me into heaven. And you just get further and further and further in debt. And uh, uh, in fact, I got news for you. If you're trying to do good things to make up for bad things, those good things have become bad things. Isn't that amazing? Uh, why? Because your motive isn't to do good things, it's to overcome bad things that you did. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we hurt somebody. What's our national intent? I want to do something nice to make up for having hurt them. Well, you're not doing it to be nice. You're doing it to overcome what you've already done. And uh, 
uh, we're, we're, we're morally bankrupt uh, as we come into this world uh, and we just haven't realized it yet. Uh, and every day we go further and further in debt. Isaiah 64, 6 says, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses. Notice that all, all, we are all. That includes you. Now we like the, uh, the, the, the word some, don't we? Even many I can put up with. Why? Because I can let that kind of go on past me. Dodge that one. Many, yeah, but that's not me. That's, that's many. But that word all, you can't dodge it, can you? God says all. And it says, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses. There's that word all again. Well, yeah, some of the good things I did were for a bad motive, but all you can't escape that. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. We're, 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 we're dead already, just don't realize it. Uh, you know, it's a, a good illustration for kids sometimes. Uh, you know, you, you take that fall leaf that's, you know, a, a green, but it's off the tree. And all of a sudden it starts changing colors. It's nice to try to stop that color at orange or some pretty color or whatever. Uh, but uh, but that, that leaf, when it's it falls off the tree... Uh, it's green, it's, it's dead already, it just doesn't realize it. But you know that color begins to fade and pretty soon you, uh, you, you find this brown, uh, you know, and, and decaying uh, uh, leaf and be before you know it's just dust. The Bible says we all do fade as a leaf and all our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You've been there, ever been there where you you you, you uh, out on a windy day and, and something gets away from you, a piece of paper, and you're chasing it down the street and you can't seem to grab it? It's always funny to watch somebody else do that, but it's not so much fun when it's you, right? But, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to be a litter bug. It's maybe not that important to me or whatever, but uh, I don't want to be a litter bug. And so here I am, you know, chasing it down the street and you're almost just, just close enough. I've had those times that, uh, you know, uh, where it, it even, it's almost like it's alive. It lets you get close and the wind blows again and it's gone again and, and you're just, you know, chasing it down the street and uh, you come to a certain point and he's like, ah, I give up. And you just let it kind of blow away. And uh, that's the way many people are with their moral bankruptcy. Uh, trying and trying and trying religion and everything else to get those good works to overcome those bad works and for a while you just kind of throw your hands up in the air and it's what i am i might as well live it up there's, there's a lot of people in that point but they are bankrupt but every one of us are morally bankrupt born into this world and uh, we just maybe haven't realized it yet some probably won't realize it until they get to eternity and the judgment of god it's the point a man wants to die, then the judgment, uh, morally bankrupt. But I'd like you to notice here in chapter number four, verse number six. Verse number six, the Bible says, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. God imputeth righteousness without works. That word impute, you find it come up here a few times in the passage. Impute means to credit to a person or cause. Uh, in Latin, the term is imputare, which is the root for uh, the uh, definition in English, but it means to enter in the account. To ascribe, to assign, to credit, to a credit, to chalk up, to connect with, associate with. You know, my wife, uh, this, uh, this last week, not, not this week, but the prior week, uh, she uh, got her check from the post office. And uh, uh, exciting check. Why? Because it was double what it normally is. Praise the Lord. And, uh, uh, and uh, well, she got suspicious. She said, wait a minute. That's more than what I'm supposed to get. What would you do with it? Uh, well, she called up the post office. She said, I, I think that I got more than I was supposed to. We started looking at the stub, and you know, she works, I think, 13 hours uh, a week. And, and uh, anyway, it had 40 hours on it. 
Maybe they're giving her a bonus. Go cash the check and before you can and quit your job and, and run with it, huh? Uh, it's only, you know, it, it, I mean, not only, but it came out like $300. But uh, it, it was a, a bonus. Uh, well, uh, called and, and anyway, we talked to the clerk at the, the post office and, and she said she'd made a mistake and she put one of the carrier's hours on Angelina's hours. And uh, uh, he didn't even notice. And uh, gave her extra work hours. And so, uh, so as he, uh, he didn't even notice. He says, you know, the funny thing is, is he accepted his paycheck and he was just fine with it. And, uh, but she did. And, of course, the clerk thanked her for finding it, for, for not finding it. It's not hard to find free money, is it? But uh, uh, thanked her for bringing it to their attention. And they will take back what extra she got paid. And, and uh, they told her, go ahead and cash the check, and you'll just notice your check's going to be smaller the next uh, uh, few weeks to, to make up for that. But uh, what happened was, was his hours were accredited to her account. Wouldn't that be something, Brother Bob, if you go down to the bank and, and uh, you, uh, uh, you know, are going to get some money out and you, you, count, you look down at the bottom of the, the, the account and, and uh, your receipt or whatever you get from the ATM and, and you see that you now have a billion dollars. What would you do? Uh, you wouldn't call your wife, would you? You wouldn't want her to know, right? Uh, Got to keep that a secret. Pass out, yeah. All of a sudden, a billionaire. Bob's a billionaire. Even for a day, that'd be, you know, something to, but uh, a billionaire. And, and uh, you know, I, I know what Bob would do. He'd turn around and go in the bank and say, oh, wait a minute. I've, you know, something's wrong here. What, tell me what's wrong. Uh, and then all of a sudden, she, she says, well, uh, we had a, a man that came in, and, and he must know you from someplace because uh, he, uh, he uh, wrote out the billion dollar check and he told us to deposit it in your account and he doesn't want you to know who it is so he's not going to tell you but uh, you know he just gave you a billion dollars and and uh, of course uh, Bob's uh, you know uh, all of a sudden got a lot of friends but uh, uh, you know uh, what does that mean he credited it to your account that word impute to credit to your account uh, what somebody else's but they credit it to your account notice here the bible says very clear in 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 uh, the the uh, uh, explanation but in, in verse six is even as david also described the blessedness of the man when i was seven years old i trusted christ as my savior i became the man and uh uh, but uh, the, the man that is saved says even as david also described the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputeth righteousness without works i thought righteousness was works that which is right with god righteousness is works uh, the bible says he imputeth righteousness the bible says here notice the statement says unto whom god imputeth righteousness without works you know what that does that throws religion out doesn't it that just cancels out most of the religions of the world, including many that say that they're Christian. Uh, imputed righteousness is the term. But uh, all of a sudden he imputes it. Philippians 3, 9 says this, and he found in him not having, and being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Imputed Righteousness. You became a multi-trillionaire or quadzillionaire overnight. The Bible says you became, and not even overnight. The Bible says in an instant you became a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father became your father. Adopted into his family. Imputed righteousness. All of a sudden it was all accredited to your account. The Bible says we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You already got a home in heaven. Uh, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Just waiting to get back to that mansion. Or get to that mansion. And, and uh, all of heaven. And all of its glory. And, and uh, imputed righteousness. You know that righteousness was not. Uh, you never earned it. And you can't earn it. There's some that are still trying to add to what Christ did. 
They're still trying to think, if, you know, if I uh, do enough, I can add to what Christ has did, has done. I'd encourage you, Brother Bob, to, uh, don't, don't, don't live the rest of your life trying to add to that billion dollars. Okay? Just live your life honoring that man who gave you that billion dollars. Uh, you know, there's people that are Christians that are still trying to add to what Christ has already done. He says, I imputed to you, your righteousness is as filthy rags, by the way. Uh, you really can't do anything for God. I can't do anything. We, we use those terms. I'm doing it for the Lord. You can't do anything for God. Uh, I can't do anything for God. But God can do lots of stuff through me. Uh, but uh, to spend the rest of your life not trying to add to what Christ has done, just honor him who gave you it all. The Bible says that the moment you became a child of God, you cannot add to what God has already done. Uh, he imputed it to your account in righteousness uh, to your account the day that you got saved the moment you trusted Christ as your savior you'll always fall short you'll always fail God uh, you know the person that comes along and says I'm doing a good job serving God don't fool yourself uh, God's sure doing a good job through you though isn't he uh, and uh, but uh, I, I'm sure doing a good job for serving God and sometimes we look at other people and say they're not doing a very good job for serving God but I'm doing a good job serving God everything you do will fail you'll never sing good enough you'll never give enough you'll never perform good enough uh, we serve a holy God Joshua tried to tell the people that when uh, you know uh, uh, that uh, they, they say the Lord he, he is our God and and uh, we, 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 we will serve him he says you can't serve a holy God. You can't he's perfect. How can you serve Have you ever tried to serve somebody who's a perfectionist. And they're always going back behind and pick on my wife today she's coming up here just in the flight it's just driving me crazy. Of course uh, I, I made sure I asked her did you bring those flowers. She says, yeah I brought the flowers. Oh, okay. Uh, because I know sometimes people can get kind of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a little bit uh, upset because you're trying to improve on what they did. But, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, you can never, you'll always let God down. Uh, well, as far as uh, you'll always fall short, you'll always, uh, it'll never be good enough to perfection. How can you measure up to perfection? Uh, whatever we do, it, it'll never, you know, be done exactly right. Will always be unprofitable servants. Always be unprofitable servants. Uh, everything we do but God gives us imputed righteousness. Uh, and God wants to work through our lives and God wants to do some things. Uh, anytime we find ourselves saying boy I sure did a good job there didn't I? Boy you just messed it up. Uh, you just messed it up. Uh, it, it'll never be good enough. Uh, but when you turn your life over to Christ and let him do some things through you, God will always make up for you, won't he? Uh, I mean, he's the, the wonderful, loving father. Uh, I can remember as a, a kid, uh, you know, uh, bringing home that uh, Valentine's Day heart. Uh Nothing spelled right on it. Uh, crooked lines every place. Piece of crepe paper. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, that's uh, our crepe paper. It was uh, construction paper. But, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, I gave that to mom. And the biggest smile that came on her face uh, that I had made that for her. I did my best. And I was so proud of that as I brought it home. I remember years later seeing that heart. And, uh sure glad I can do better now but uh, God accepts what we bring to him doesn't he uh, but it's kind of like one of those construction paper hearts we're talking about the God of perfection uh, the God of holiness uh, the God of righteousness that does everything right it's amazing how God will take whatever we do and he'll make it right uh, he'll he, he, he'll use it and he'll he'll uh, uh, take and, and work through it and and uh, the Bible says here that the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness 
In fact, one day in heaven, the Bible says he's even going to give us rewards. Uh, it's kind of like the time when, when uh, uh, Solomon, he took up that uh, offering and all the people brought, you know, things and he went to the Lord and he said, thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to give back to you what you gave to us. It was all his in the first place. He didn't say, look, Lord, look what we did. We gave all this. We did all this. No, he says, just thank you that you let us give back to you what you gave to us. And uh, that's all we have to give to God anyway. What God does to us. But he's going to one day, he's going to reward us. And uh, like proud children, the smile on the father's face is going to be plenty. Live your life. Giving honor to the one who gave you the billion dollar deposit. Because you'll never be able to repay it. And you'll never be able to add to it because your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Uh, he was the businessman able to produce it. You'll never be able to measure up to it. In fact, I can't imagine. Can you imagine, you know, uh, trying to invest and properly take care of that much? Uh, I'm glad God doesn't bless us with that. Uh, you know, one day we're going to get to to be in heaven and all of its glory and it's all ours and and uh, enjoy it. We could never take care of it, though, could we? Uh, praise the Lord. God's the one that's uh, handling all that. But, uh, you know, uh, the Bible says here uh, from rags to riches, imputed righteousness. I want you to notice, secondly, uh, we have an imputed righteousness without work. And you'll find that stress throughout this chapter. But notice, if you would, verse eight. Blessed is. Again, the man. Who's the man, the, the saved one? The one who's trusted Christ as their personal Savior. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That sounds kind of definite, doesn't it? Will not impute sin. What does that mean? He will not put sin to your account. There's nothing you can ever do that will cause God to put sin to your account. He will not. Put sin to your account. Uh, you want a, a promise of assurance of salvation? Romans chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says he will not impute sin. There's some that believe, they call it the holiness uh, you know, a, a, a movement or whatever. They believe you, you, you actually achieve a place where you don't sin anymore. And then you can say once you, you achieve that, uh, that uh, uh, place uh, where you won't sin anymore, then you can be assured of your salvation. But until you reach that plateau, that place where you'll never sin anymore, you're always in suspect. Depending on how good that day is and how you felt that day, you're always in suspect. You may get to go to heaven, you may not. See, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. He paid for all my sins. Well, yeah, but if you go out and mess up, then uh, you, you can't be sure. Uh, in fact, throughout history, they... They find many times that you'll find in, in religious writings and church history and such, they uh, belittle the Baptists because of that assurance of salvation, eternal security. Once you trust Christ as your Savior, you're saved. The Bible says here, He will not impute sin. It doesn't say that man no longer sins. It says He will not impute sin. No longer will that sin be chalked up to your account. When you sin, well, whose account does it go to then? The Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he took it all upon the cross. And uh, it all goes to him. But he will not. No matter what you try to do, you cannot get God to credit your account with sin. The Bible says he will not. That's, that's definite. You can't get any more definite than that. He will not impute sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's able to save them to the uttermost. Now I don't think you can get any utter than uttermost. It's the uttermost, isn't it? The uttermost of wherever your life would take you. It's the uttermost. Look at Romans chapter 8. I know we're jumping ahead because we'll get to Romans chapter 8, but Romans chapter 8, 
wonderful passage of Scripture, but I'd like you to notice verse 38. It's talking to a community uh, church preacher, and not all community churches believe like this, but, uh, but he believed you could lose your salvation. And I was talking to him. He says, uh, you know, uh, there it says, show me a, a scripture that says that I won't, I uh, can't lose my salvation. And so we went to, uh, to uh, here in chapter 38 and 39 of Romans. Chapter 8 says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I read that to him and he says, well, yeah, but that doesn't anywhere say you can't. You can't separate yourself from God. You can't make a decision that you no longer want to be a child of God and you can't leave Jesus Christ. You can't, uh, you know, I've heard people say that when when Jesus said that he places you in his hand, no man's able to pluck you out. And he says, yeah, but you can leave. You can leave. That's what they talk about, losing your salvation. You can leave. You can make that choice. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. And so we just looked at that verse again. I said, well, wait a minute. Verse 38. And this, you know, this is the Holy Spirit of God. It wasn't anything that I studied or, uh, you know, uh, just reading through it. All of a sudden, just, you know, glaring came to attention. But, uh, you know, it's just uh, God trying to reach this, this uh, preacher's uh, heart. And, and, uh, but verse 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. And I stopped right there and I said, What does life mean? Neither death. I, mean, I understand what death means. Death can't separate us from the love of God. Well, when we die, we're going to get to instantly be with him in heaven, aren't we? Death might separate you from me for a time. If you're not saved, uh, it'll be for all eternity. But if you are saved for a time, we'll be separated. But death can't separate you from God. God's here in, I, I, today and God's you know, going to be there. The Bible says uh, so, so death. But, but what does he mean by life? Uh, what does it mean by life? Life can't separate you from God. Uh, well, that wherever my life would take me, uh, whatever would take place in my life, it can't separate me from God. When I became a child of God, adopted by him, nothing is able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That verse in Romans chapter 4 says, he will not impute sin. Chapter 4, verse 8. He will not impute sin. In the United States of America, we have a wonderful thing called bankruptcy. You say, what's so wonderful about bankruptcy? Uh, well, you can get so far in debt, so far over your head, there's no way possible you're ever going to be able to pay those debts. And you can go to the court system and you can file for bankruptcy. But what does bankruptcy do? It erases all of your debts. I just imagine a man who's under that kind of pressure with all that financial debt and he can't do anything about it. And he's in a hopeless situation and he can go down to the courthouse and he can file bankruptcy and all of a sudden all of his debts are gone. And that pressure is removed off of his life. And now he's got a clean slate. But the problem in many cases is, is that man hasn't changed. What's that man going to do? He's going to go out and start charging up debt again, isn't he? And for seven years, I think it's seven years, isn't it? Uh, for seven years, he cannot file bankruptcy again. And, uh, uh, and so he's got to wait seven years before he goes and gets that clean slate again. The Bible says God will not impute sin to the one that's saved. Uh, you come to God and you declare bankruptcy. God, I'm morally bankrupt. I'm lost. I'm condemned. I deserve hell for my sin. I believe you love me. And I want to declare bankruptcy. Uh, I need Jesus to save me. And you sincerely from your heart in a heart of repentance ask Christ to be your Savior. The Bible says the debt is clean. Not only is the debt clean, but you get imputed righteousness. 
Not only does he clean the slate, but he loads up the account. And he loads up the account with the amount of money you'll never be able to spend in your life. Well, not use money, but, uh, but uh, he, he gives imputed righteousness. He gives Christ's righteousness. And then he gives the promise that he will not impute sin to your account. You'll never go bankrupt again. We stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. We stand before him in his righteousness. Not in our own. Look with me to the Old Testament. Second Samuel chapter number 19. Second Samuel chapter number 19. When you trusted Christ as your savior. It was not because of your works. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves. We need to remember that. Not of yourselves. It was the gift of God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Here in 2 Samuel chapter number 19. Very quick review. David has a son who, uh, Absalom who wants the kingdom and he rises up against his dad and he gets an army and they're going to take it. And so David, uh, you know, in order to preserve Jerusalem, uh, he uh, he leaves the city with his men and and they go out to take the battle out in the wilderness and they're, uh, you know, out uh, in the wilderness and away from the city. And and anyway, Absalom, he comes, moves into the city and and he's now got control of it and he's going to take over the kingdom. And and uh, they go out. And and of course, uh, you know, uh, most of the kingdom has become faithful to Absalom and and is, is serving, uh, serving Absalom. And and, and so uh, uh, David just kind of discouraged out there in the wilderness because of the heart of the people. So turning against him and and uh, uh, all the things are taking place, let alone his own son. Uh, turning against him and and uh, anyway so battle takes place and Absalom's life is is taken in the battle and David's army wins and now David's coming back home he's coming to move back into Jerusalem and and well uh, the Bible says when he went out of Jerusalem something took place a, a, a young man by the name of Mephibosheth uh, Mephibosheth he uh, he uh, uh, he was uh, Jonathan's son David's best friend David's best friend's son and uh, uh, Mephibosheth, when, uh, when uh, uh, Saul uh, died in battle and, and David became the new king, they were afraid that David was going to kill Mephibosheth because he was in line to be an heir of the throne. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the, the servant there t picked him up as a baby and carried him out. In the process, she dropped him and uh, broke his leg and he was crippled. Uh, and uh, he's hiding out in Ziba's house and and uh, you know uh, is, is keeping him hid and and uh, anyway David becomes the king he'd made a promise to Jonathan he told Jonathan for Jonathan's sake uh, that he would take care of Jonathan's kids and so after David becomes the king and and it gets a, a relative time of peace and Jerusalem is the capital and it built and David remembers that promise he made to Jonathan and 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 so uh, so he makes a search and he says is there uh, is there any of the children of Jonathan left? Well, there is one and he's hiding. His name is Mephibosheth. David says go get him and bring him. Mephibosheth, I always picture this, probably fear and trembling. He's crippled. He's without anything. He's lost his status as being a prince. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, you know, uh, in fact, an enemy of the throne. And he comes in before King David, and he bows down before him. And I expect he's thinking, boy, this is it. Uh, it's, it's time for death. And, you know, uh, John, uh, uh, David, King David, he says, rise up, Mephibosheth, and he says, listen, I'm going to restore to you all the lands of your father. And all the days of your life, you're going to sit at my table and I'm going to take care of you. And all of a sudden, Mephibosheth becomes one of David's family. Well, when this time takes place, as Absalom comes into the city and David leaves with all of his people, uh, Mephibosheth stays behind. When this takes place now, he's in line to be the the uh, he's the only uh, as far as we know, the only living heir of Saul. 
uh, at this time because through uh, uh, circumstances and things that, that uh, uh, you know, all the others have been, uh, not that David killed them uh, specifically for that reason, but uh, because of some things Saul did. And, and, uh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, and, and so, uh, so Mephibosheth, he stays behind. And, of course, uh, his servant comes out. And David says, where's Mephibosheth? And said, oh, he's, he's expecting to, you know, be risen up. He's going to stay in the capital and, and uh, honor uh, your son as he comes in and whatever. And, and, uh, uh, and so David says, listen, all of his lands and everything, they're, they're yours. And, you know, it's just kind of a, you know, a situation takes place. And as, as they return, though, David's coming back. Absalom is, is now dead. David is king once again. And, and uh, notice here, if you would, in, in verse number 24. Verse 24. It says, Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? He just asked the question, why, why didn't you leave Jerusalem with me with all the others that were faithful to me? The Bible says here in verse 26, And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and go to the king because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. What do I see here, that servant? Kind of like the devil, you know, he's the accuser. And uh, he says, uh, Mephibosheth, why, why didn't you go with me? You know, the Bible says in verse Number 28, for all, uh, all my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Well, verse 29, and the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king has come again in peace unto his own house. You know, he leaves it there. I always kind of want to find out who was guilty and who was innocent, don't you? Uh, now, is Mephibosheth telling the truth or is the servant telling the truth? Did Mephibosheth really stay there thinking he was going to be lifted up to, to be on the throne or did the servant just lie about it? We never really get to find out for sure because the Bible says that David doesn't, he says, speak no more of it. Split the land and that's it. Split, the, say no more of it. Split the land and that's it. And they go on. Why? To David, it doesn't make a difference. He didn't bring Mephibosheth into his house and honor him as a son because of Mephibosheth. He did it for a promise made to Jonathan. Literally, Mephibosheth could have done anything he wanted in the kingdom. And David still would have honored his promise. Because his promise wasn't to Mephibosheth. His promise was to Jonathan. God the Father has made a promise to the Son. Jesus died for our sins. The Bible says all those sins went to his account. And God will not impute sin to our account. He will not, the Bible says, impute sin to our account. He'd have to go around the Lord Jesus Christ to do that. The Bible says that Jesus Christ paid it all. It's paid for. The sins and things that you and I commit, they go to Christ's account. And He's paid it all. God will not impute sin. Not that he would want to go around the Lord Jesus Christ to impute sin because God's the one that sent his son in the first place because of his love for us. God did do it for our behalf. But he honors the son's sacrifice. God will not impute sin. From rags to riches, morally bankrupt, 
Come to God and declare bankruptcy. Come to God and, you know, there's a lot of people in this world trying to do all kinds of stuff to try to make God happy. You can't make a holy God happy. Only Jesus Christ can. Uh, you can't make a holy God, I mean, he's holy. Nothing you do will ever be good enough for holiness. It's got a measure of depression. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It'll always come short. The only one who could ever make up with good for all the bad that you and I have done is the Lord Jesus Christ. He went to the cross and he paid the price for our sins. When you trust Christ as your Savior, he imputes righteousness to your account. And he will not impute sin to that account. You come to him and you declare bankruptcy. The accounts are cleaned up. A huge deposit is made. A deposit that no one in this earth could ever make. And there will never be another debt put against that account. From rags to riches. Let's stand as we have the invitation this morning. Don't spend your life trying to add to that account. Your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Just spend your life honoring the one who loved you enough that he came and he died to pay for your sins. Love the God who will not impute sin to your account. The one who would love you enough to adopt you into his family, make you a joint heir with his own son, Do our best. But really it's all all him. Not me. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would bless the message this morning. And Lord, your word and the scriptures, the promises. Father, just uh, through the Apostle Paul trying to share what takes place when a, a person is saved that we could understand. Lord, on that day, that time, that point where we trusted you, you imputed righteousness to that account and you will not impute sin. And that, Father, we're eternally secure in you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we live a life that would be a thanksgiving offering, a praise because of what you've done for us. I pray, Father, that for those that aren't saved here this morning, Lord, today they'd realize they're bankrupt. Morally speaking, that, uh, Lord, they've gone over the edge. There's no way that we could ever make up for what we've done. But, Lord, they just come and declare bankruptcy today and Turn and ask Jesus to be their Savior. I just pray, Lord, that you'd bless the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.